I wanted to make sure we had a little time to talk about this, this new thing we're seeing, which is vaping-related lung disease. So this has the unfortunate name of Evali, uh, e-cigarette vaping product associated lung injury. And this uh, just appeared on the scene this summer, but uh, how many people have seen a case of Evali at their institution? Okay, so many of you have seen this. Uh, this uh, data is from the end of October when there were 1,600 lung injury cases, uh, but many more have been reported uh, since then. At that time, there had been 34 deaths, 70% uh, male distribution, median age of 24, and about three-quarters of the patients had reported using products containing THC. One of the current theories is that these pods uh, that patients are using uh, have they've put uh, vitamin E as a filler to sort of thicken uh, the stuff that they're vaping. And, um, and that may be the, the, the whole reason for this disease. But not all patients report using THC. So when you encounter a case like this and you think it's vaping-related lung disease, you notify, well, we don't, but somebody notifies the public health department. They go to the patient's house, they collect the pods, and they, they take that from there to figure out what is responsible for this. They're really trying to nail down the causative uh, agent here. So this is when the disease started. So you can see that a trickle of cases in June really started becoming a national problem in July and then going up through August, September. And at this time, I did not have the more recent. But you can imagine this is an upward slope. Despite what's known, uh, what the media are covering, we're still seeing cases of this uh, Evoli. So the symptoms are confusing. At first, you know, when I had read about it, I thought, oh, well, they walk in, they're short of breath, they say, I've been vaping. It's going to be straightforward, but it's not straightforward at all because they have systemic symptoms. They don't just have cough, shortness of breath, chest pain. They have these systemic symptoms of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, fever, chills, weight loss. You think they've got an atypical pneumonia. That They walk in seeming like they have an atypical pneumonia. The symptoms may have developed very acutely over just the last few days, or it could have been more insidious and coming on over weeks. But these systemic uh, symptoms really take the clinicians down a different path. So when they come in the ER, they're going to initially think that this person is infected. Uh, now we know a lot more about this, and so we're a little bit better. But in uh, September, the CDC issued these guidelines for confirming the definition. They uh, said that they had to have used uh, an e-cigarette or vaping product within the last three months prior to the symptoms onset. That's a pretty big window. They have to have an abnormal chest X-ray or chest CT showing opacities. You have to exclude a pulmonary infection because these mimic an atypical pneumonia. We need to make sure that all the viral panels, the influenza, uh, PCR is negative. All other testing for a respiratory agent uh, is negative. And then you have to have no good reason to call it something else. And if all of that, if you basically they come in, you think it's atypical pneumonia, you know, they start them on a broad spectrum antibiotic or antiviral, but they're not responding. You never recover an organism, but then you get that history of vaping. So I'm going to show you the first case we saw. So this was a 23-year-old woman. I think this was end of July. And she had fever, chills, myalgia, dry cough, increasing dyspnea, tachycardia, and she had this history of dual use. This was her chest x-ray on admission. No matter which way I look at this, it comes back normal to me every time. I can't see anything on this chest x-ray. This is her CT three and a half hours later. And now you can see these areas, these patchy areas of subpleural uh, ground glass, maybe even more frank consolidation here. It has a pattern that sort of looks like an organizing pneumonia pattern to me, but this is acute illness. And so, as you can imagine, we read it out in late July as suggestive of an atypical pneumonia. The clinical pattern with these systemic symptoms, this chest CT looked like an atypical pneumonia. 
Uh, and this is just our multiplanar reformat showing you this very peripheral distribution of disease in this patient. This is 48 hours later. That chest X-ray has gone from uh, normal to abnormal, and you can see now the, the uh, corollary of what we were seeing on the CT. You could imagine now what was ground glass is going to be more frank consolidation with more of a basilar predominance. At this point, this patient's getting pretty sick and is being moved to the intensive care unit. And this is 72 hours after admission, and you can see she's intubated. We probably need to uh, pull that into tracheal tube back. But uh, she uh, is very sick, and they're calling in the clergy and her parents and thought we were going to lose her. Uh, so she was very, very sick. And at, this, at some point, they start piling on the steroids, and the steroids are what's going to help reverse uh, this inflammatory process. So here's the recommended management. Well, you have to treat for everything else you think could be going on, which is predominantly, you think about infection. Um, and it's interesting that the uh, physical exam is pretty unremarkable. If now that they're coming into the ER and they may not be as sick when they first present, they basically say you've got to admit if their oxygen sat is less than 95% because they could go downhill very quickly consider an empiric use of a combination of antibiotics, antivirals, or steroids. And then you want to follow up uh, very quickly after discharge because they can uh, have some uh, other complications. So she comes back three days after discharge. I think she was in the hospital for about two weeks. And three days after discharge, she comes back with crepitus on her physical examination. So at this point, she has she was discharged with a, a pattern that was sort of a resolving ARDS pattern. But now she has pneumothorax, subcutaneous emphysema, and came back into the hospital to make sure that we could uh, manage that. So you can see uh, because of this sort of ARDS pattern, she had developed uh, these cavitary and bullous type lesions, which rupture and give her uh, the pneumothorax. And you can see her pneumomediastinum as well on the CT. This is just a multiplanary format showing you sort of a resolving ARDS pattern. Uh, probably a, this is almost three weeks after her admission. This is, we brought her back in the hospital, discharge her again, and this is a week after that. Again, uh, just sort of slowly resolving ARDS. Um, not sure what we're going to see down the road. My expectation is she's going to be like some other ARDS pa patients we've had, we end, up, end up with sort of an obstructive bronchiolitis obliterans type uh, picture. So this is what she's looking like now. I, I would think uh, her lung uh, function will, will always be abnormal. So. The pathology at that time, and we had our own pathologist read it, and we sent it off for expert pathologists. The path report wasn't that helpful. Uh, the differential is quite broad. That's always a bad sign. I can give you a broad differential. I need something specific from the pathologist. It could be anything. But they did add, in this particular patient, since we told them she'd been vaping, it may be that vaping THAC is responsible. Uh, so that was our very first case. This was the next case we were smarter. This patient came into the ER, very similar picture, could have been the younger sister of the first patient, 22, myalgias, fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, history of vaping, chest X-ray, maybe a few little patchy areas, but again, hard, hard to call. And then two days later, you can see her uh, chest CT has these patchy areas of ground glass attenuation. Again, with the clinical picture, and with the CT, it would be perfectly reasonable to think this is an atypical pneumonia, uh, but now we have to add vaping-related lung disease, or EVALI, to that uh, differential. So CDC recommends a chest X-ray in all patients with a history of e-cigarette use and who have respiratory or GI symptoms, particularly when accompanied by an oxygen saturation of 95%. It's pretty high threshold, 95%, it's not that low, but uh, you just have to have a very high index of suspicion when they come in and tell you. And uh, be quick to go to CT. Even if the chest X-ray is normal, you want to be uh, quick to go on to CT because it will show you uh, findings that um, 
that you won't see on that, on that chest X-ray and will help keep, I think, the clinicians on top of the potential for rapid deterioration in this patient. So I was trying to figure out a conclusion slide for uh, tying all of these together. Um, before I do that, let me show you this. Uh, this is one article that was uh, published online in October. Uh, Travis Henry is the lead author, Imaging Findings of Vaping-Associated Lung Disease. It's going to show you uh, some more examples, and some of these were uh, obtained really before the epidemic and probably are related to the vaping itself and not necessarily to this more uh, recent THEC-associated injury. Um, and also the uh, very similar uh, slide collection is on the uh, website for Society of Thoracic Radiology, thoracicrad.org, so if you want to look at some examples. And they report that there are many imaging patterns. Again, the ones I've seen sort of look like organizing pneumonia. I think lipoid pneumonia is within that. Acute lung injury, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, uh, and even a hypersensitivity pneumonitis has been reported prior to this sort of THC phase. So uh, here's my conclusion. Smoking's bad for you.